Okay, I think we're going to get started. Before I bring uh, Michael uh, Noel up to the stage, um, just a couple of quick um, tech notes here. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm with Shindig, the platform um, you are using to view this presentation. Uh, this presentation will also, is also being recorded um, for those who couldn't make the live event. Um, it's designed to be interactive, so we hope there's, uh, if there's any questions from any of the attendees here, we uh, hope you get involved there. And um, you have some buttons on the bottom of your screen here. Um, if you want to submit a text question, you just click the question mark button. That'll be submitted um, to the host and they will see that. Uh, and if they can answer it, they'll answer it live. Um, if you'd like to come up on stage and ask a video question, which we do encourage, um, turn on your webcam or at the very least have your mic on. But if you have your webcam and mic turned on, um, you just raise your hand, click the hand button, and um, we'll bring you up on stage to ask a question. So um, that'll make it a little bit more interactive here. Um, and um, if you have any tech questions or issues or anything like that, feel free to um, just send it uh, through your question mark and we'll help you out there. But uh, everything otherwise should be pretty uh, pretty simple. So with that, um, I'm gonna bring Michael Noel up to the stage to introduce himself and um, um, his guests. Um, Mike Noel here, Blockchain Weekly. Um, this is a, a weekly event where we get together, we try and discuss things that uh, are outside of, um, uh, uh, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? You can hear me, Mike? Yep, everyone can hear me. Okay, great. Um, so we try and, and discuss things about uh, smart contracts, uh, what's happening in uh, in that type of, a, of an area in Ethereum, um, what's going on with different types of things, and, and try and stay away from the ICO craze. And um, uh, I, I know that uh, probably a lot of you are viewing this. You've made some investments in, in ICOs. Uh, you've uh, made some investments in coins and, and things of this nature, but wow, what a what a week that has been for you guys! Because uh, um, they seem to be be taking a dive. Um, I, I had a couple of my friends, you know, reach out to me and say, "Hey, you know, what's going on? What's going on? What's happening? How can we stop this?" And it's, you know, in my opinion, it's more of a of a correction. Um, when we look at uh, the potential of smart contracts. And what smart contracts can do, there's much more value there. And we've got a couple of folks uh, today. Um, uh, they're going to talk about Propy and the uh, the first uh, uh, real estate transaction that took place on the blockchain. So this is a, a real estate transaction that took place across borders, um, and it uh, took place on the blockchain. It happened real quick, real swiftly, kind of the um, uh, kind of the yardstick for what uh, what can happen in the future. Uh, and it's just a, a small compartment. We have we have real estate, we have transportation, we have banking, uh, we have insurance. There's all kinds of different industries that are are being disrupted and and changed. Um, uh, you know, supercomputing. Uh, uh, you know, Cray Computers uh, no longer has the world's largest supercomputer. Uh, Bitcoin owns that one. Uh, and 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 we have people that are taking a look at how how we we take the supercomputing power of something like this and. And take it and point it over to do something, uh, something different, more, more constructive. Uh, and how do we add value to uh, uh, that kind of computing power? So that's a that's a whole new model that's uh, that's opened up. Um, Bitcoin right now, I'll, um, uh, I think Ether is trading uh, at about eight hundred and sixty bucks. It was up at uh, one thousand four hundred at one time. Uh, Bitcoin. Uh, is trading at um, look, uh, under 10,000. Um, and uh, it's been an up and down ride. So a lot of you guys have had uh, uh, gains and losses. Uh, we're going to have an individual on that can uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the tax ramifications and what we're, what, uh, what can be done, uh, what needs to be done, and, and how do we keep everyone safe. But it's been it's been quite quite the uh, uh, the week. Uh, last week we talked with Flurry, um, F L U R dot E E. Flurry is a database company that interfaces with 
um, uh, blockchain. Um, they can actually build a blockchain, but not so much. ERC-20 and interfacing as, a, as a, an off-coin database seems to be where, they're, uh, where they feel comfortable. Um, and I'm working on a couple of projects with them at this point. Uh, interesting stuff going on with Flurry. Uh, if you're working on an ICO or working on projects, please reach out to them. And once again, um, I, I want to say thanks to Mike McCaucus and um, uh, uh, Shindig. This is a, an, an awesome platform here. Um, not a whole ton of people here uh, today, not as many as I expected. Um, don't know what that is, but uh, there are some, uh, are some people there. You're in the audience. You can, uh, uh, can actually join with one another and have uh, sidebars and talk while we're uh, uh, speaking on the, on the podium here. So that's uh, definitely something to think about. If you see someone that's interesting, ping them and, and figure out how that works. Uh, while we're talking, if you have a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Say, hey, listen, I, uh, I have a, a question. Uh, if you have a comment, do you want to come up on stage? We're more than happy to bring you up on stage uh, uh, while we're talking and, and, and talk a little bit about that. So uh, lots of interesting things as far as Shindig, uh, the venue, and it, it, I, I feel like I'm in a big auditorium right now. So um, and, and the, there's, there's folks that are sitting in the audience. You can have sidebars. Uh, ask questions. Uh, it's a great, um, uh, it, it, it's a great program. It's a great uh, software. It's a great venue for meetings like this. If you, if you have something that you'll be doing in the future, think about Shindig, think about reaching out to Mike and, and asking him a little bit about that. Um, when we're talking about ICOs and, and some of the slaughter that's happened, there have been a couple of bright, uh, uh, bright things. And I think this is all this is more a correction, and we're looking at what the fundamentals are. Um, what's the value that uh, the coin brings to the table? Um, it, it, we've talked a little bit, and we had uh, a guest uh, not too long ago, Budbo, B-U-D-B-O, B-U-D-B-O dot I-O, Budbo. Um, they were a guest, and uh, they're doing their um, global cannabis uh, blockchain. They're keeping track of uh, the quality and the medicinal properties of medical marijuana from stem or uh, from seed to to store uh, and they're developing that blockchain now uh, they might be using flurry by the way so lots of lots of things happening here um, when they when uh, budbo came on I think uh, their pre-sale was at 20 million tokens that they were releasing uh, and I think they had sold like eight million or so um, I was on the phone today with Rick uh, and with Luke, and um, um, they've sold their 20 million. So uh, there's a there's a success uh, story for you in the um, uh, cryptocurrency area. Um, that's budbo io. They'll be moving into uh, uh, out of presale and into the next section. So you might want to take a look at them. Uh, they seem to be doing real well. Um, we had um, uh, we had some big hacking that happened uh, this last week since the last time we spoke. Um, but here again, the hacking that's going on seems to be um, in the wallets and in the software, uh, in the smart contracts, really. I mean, we, we really have to start looking at smart contracts and the way we're building them and the way we're putting them together um, and the use cases that we're doing and the way we're, we're developing the software. The hacking is that's going on and the, the, uh, the penetration that's going on, nothing is happening on the blockchain. It's all happening on uh, uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the stuff that we build, uh, the exchanges, the smart contracts, and that kind of stuff. So it's interesting to note that. Um, uh, what else? The Bitcoin Ethereum Blockchain Super Co uh, Conference, um, and I think this is in February. Um, January dates are February 16th, 17th, and 18th. We've talked about them uh, a little bit. Uh, that's in Dallas, Texas. Um, they, they're sold out, so you can't get a, a ticket. We can't tell you any more about it, but uh, that's just a, uh, another example of, of the things that we, we've talked about as far as uh, smart contracts, that type of, of a thing that where we're developing. We're looking at rationalizing workflows, and, uh, and and taking workflows and putting them on a distributed ledger 
that's the kind of things that will be going on at the uh, uh, these uh, super conference. Uh, that's the kind of speakers they have, and, and they're oversubscribed, and and uh, uh, they have really had some 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 great activity. Um, so a lot of good things going on, a lot of bad things going on, a lot of churn going on, a lot of people asking a lot of questions about, um, uh, you know, what should I invest in? And my answer has always been, you know, look at the fundamentals, look at something that uh, is useful and, and uh, adds value. Um, Ethereum, of course, uh, tends to uh, be my pick uh, uh, of the day, and it's done very well. Um, I'm, I'm a miner for Ethereum, as you can tell. I, uh, oh, yeah, there you go. I'm testing some new cards, seeing um, uh, where they go, and we're building new rigs. Oh, mining is mining is this week has just been crazy. Uh, um, um, uh, I got a um, uh, an engagement from a group that wants to build uh, eventually a hundred uh, GPU mining rigs, and we have uh, we've spent some time on this. We've we put together the, the place to do it, the electricity, and, and put together with the schema. We've done testing. Uh, we really understand this, and, and we are, we're ready to go forward and move forward on doing mining for this group. Um, and they've uh, uh, we, had, we had finally got our capital contribution on Tuesday, went out to buy a whole bunch of uh, mining rigs and a whole bunch of GPUs, and you can't find any GPUs. Uh, the GPUs that we're selling for, uh, you know, 450 480 last uh last week or selling for eight nine hundred bucks this week at uh you know pieces like fries and and best buy and um you know compuserve and uh, not compuserve but um insight um you know it's like 16 different vendors i keep on checking but um uh, the pricing is just going through the roof and there's there's not really that much inventory um fries electronics i mean uh, it, it really was a telling story. You, everyone probably knows Fry's Electronics. It's one of our favorites, um, and, and everyone knows it. They've probably seen it a thousand times. Uh, I went out to buy, buy GPUs the other day at Fry's Electronics, and there was zero. So everyone's getting into mining. It's, uh, uh, the, the industry is evolving and evolving quickly, and if you're not in it, then you probably should be. Um, that, that's the kind of the week that we've had, and it's been a, a great week. It's been a, an interesting week. I want to get Leslie Pico up here, um, and uh, Leslie is with a company called um, uh, Swap. I think I think this will work. I'm hoping this will work. Up, oh, maybe not. New pod. Yep, there you go. Leslie, hi. <laughs> can you how hear you? me? Yes, I'm, I'm well. I'm well. I'm well. Um, how are you today? Excellent, excellent. Um, please excuse the casual wear. I volunteer um, for a nonprofit on Wednesday mornings at nine, so I came straight from there. <laughs> well, good for you. Well, good for you. That's uh, that's always good. Um, so you're you, you do nonprofit work, obviously, but um, you're also tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Propy and, and about the uh, real estate transaction, and uh, let's hear a little bit about you. Yeah, so um, my background is in programming and system analysis. I also um, did a little bit of small business consulting um, for a few years. Um, I came into businesses, tried to identify areas of inefficiency, um, a lot of CRM rollout, organizational change in that respect. But I was always interested in the new um, and what we could do to continue innovating as a whole, um, you know, in business, trade, um, how the world of business is done. Um, I got into blockchain a few years ago. Um, it was a little daunting, you know, two years ago when I attempted to understand it. And now I'm more excited than ever. Um, I was able to get in touch with this great company that I'm working for now, Proppy, and we are revolutionizing real estate transactions on the blockchain. So, all right. so how long is, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so initially, you know, the platform and the entire objective was to facilitate the cross-border transaction and make it easier um, for us to engage in global trade and sale of these physical assets with the international buyers. And so 
<coughs> international buyer, someone in Dubai can invest in real estate in Scottsdale, Arizona, for instance. Exactly. That's the idea. Um, and you've been involved in real estate for quite some time, commercial real estate. I understand we, we met just last week a little bit and had a quick chat, by the way, I've enjoyed it very much. Um, Thank you. And, and kind of tell us, you know, what some of the, the roadblocks uh, to someone, you know, offshore that was looking to, you know, buy real estate or invest in real estate in the United States. So what are, what are, what are the, some of the things that, um, uh, that the hurdles they had to overcome? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, what's kind of lacking is a standardized uniform platform in which we can do these transactions. Um, jurisdictions and regulations all have a different process and requirements here in the United States, for example, it's down to the counties. Um, overseas, uh, some countries don't even have a formal um, title registry or any way to document or, um, you know, it's more difficult to do your due diligence to understand if the person you're purchasing this physical asset from truly owns this property. How do we have a record of this? How do we make this happen? You um, now go into the world of involving a lot of third party intermediaries notaries, power of attorney, attorneys, uh, travel, um, having to compa comply with government regulation there as well, where sometimes you are expected to travel and stay in the country where you're purchasing property for any minimum amount of time, it becomes very costly um, and just inefficient. So we wanted to yeah. solve that. And change that. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's a problem. It really is. Um, and it's it's kind of common as I'm looking at uh, at you know rationalizing workflows as we call it. I mean the the process of of, of doing a smart contract. Um, you know there's there's a couple of qualifications. One of them is sticky bits. Are there people? Uh, um, uh, one of them is transfer of trust. That's the first one that we look at. And and when you have intermediaries, people like agents and brokers and and escrow agents and things of this nature. Really, the only th what they're there for is the transfer of trust. I have one person on one end of the transaction, one person on the other end of the transaction, and I need someone in the middle that can can transfer the trust between those two uh, between those two players because they don't know one another and they're in a different different world or different uh, uh, um, uh, a different nation or a different country. Uh, that makes it much more difficult. With blockchain, uh, it, it it simplifies the process a lot easier. Um, and if you have a, a, a piece of property. Um, you know, for instance, in Phoenix, Arizona, Doug Ducey has passed a law that signatures on a smart contract are legal and binding. So we have the opportunity to actually uh, have a uh, an Alta policy that binds a piece of property to a smart contract. If it if it binds it to a smart contract, then the smart contract owns that property. And uh, how do we find out who owns that property now, 20 years down the road? Well, we can lens the uh, the distributed ledger. Um, and understand, uh, you know, who owns a property, who had it 10 years ago, who had it 15 years ago, who has it today. Uh, it's just that simple. We, uh, the, the, the process of title becomes a lot easier. Um, and the process of transferring that title becomes a lot easier. Is that, is that, that's basically what Propy is doing, right? Right. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of players that are currently involved. And as we roll out our different phases, um, and just kind of increase consumer awareness and adoption. Um, a lot of the current you know, players involved in the leg legacy way of doing a real estate transaction will continue to have to be involved. That's just the way it is. Um, and it's exactly, it goes back to the trust. Um, the Ukrainian transaction though was a great example and it is available, it's open source code. If you visit our blog, um, Proppy's blog, you can see the details and a little more in-depth technical details in our GitHub repo as far as how the transaction was completed. Can you give me that link? Yes. Um, should, I, should I put it in the, the chat box? What is it? <laughs> yeah, just spell it out. Just say what the, what the it's link is. It's pretty long. It's, uh, let's well, you can go to propy.com, right? Yes. If you go to uh, blog.propy.com, um, and I will go ahead and share the link here in the chat. And um, uh, that is P-R-O. P-R-O-P-Y. P-R-O-P-Y dot. Com. I-O dot com. Okay. P-R-O-P-Y dot com. Okay. Good. 
Um, and uh, you can find information. I think we sent out some stuff with some links um, out to Propy. So if you're coming to us from LinkedIn, you're coming to us from an email blast, um, you're coming to us from Facebook, you probably have some content in there that links out to that also. Uh, so go ahead, talk a little bit about the transaction and how, and how it happened. Yeah, so it started with the Proppy iOS app. Um, currently, you can download it in the App Store. We are going to be releasing an Android version before the end of June this year. So for all of our Android users, it's coming. Um, you can also create an account and log in and view all the same things online. Um, with the Ukrainian transaction, it did start in the app. Uh, we deployed the smart contract into the Ethereum mainnet. So Etherscan also has a little more in-depth um, information in regards to transaction. We recognize that it's a little bit hard for the non-technical person to really be able to pull and search and um, read through that. So we are also working on an explorer that's coming soon that would make it uh, easier to search and inspect those transactions. Um, but we uh, performed the ownership verification um, at the decentralized uh, registry. So Proppy has we've built a registry, um, and from there we generated the preliminary agreement uh, of this specific transaction. So it was a condo in the Ukraine. Um, after uh, the preliminary agreement was generated, all parties signed. Um, once they came to an agreement and was signed, then uh, payment is done. So the sale price is a sale price. I know a lot of the questions that we get sometimes is, okay, well, uh, Bitcoin is so volatile, uh, Ether is so volatile, you know, how, how does that uh, payment get processed at the end of the day? Um, for us, the listed sale price will always be the sale price. Um, there is a part of the process where an affidavit comes into play, an exchange rate is agreed upon. So whatever the exchange is to reach that sale price, and then that's when the uh, payment is transferred. So in effect, it doesn't take long where we are feeling the effects of whatever uh, market volatility is occurring. Um, and so the payment is, is a lot simpler than people sometimes anticipate before we've had a chance to really break down the transaction. Um, in the case of the Ukrainian transaction, after the payment was done, uh, the notary made sure it was all compliant, um, that everything was good to go. And uh, if it was, in this, in this case, it, it did meet all the, the compliant requirements. Uh, the notary sends the info, because uh, this was done in conjunction with the government, uh, to the Registry of Ownership, where also the deed smart contract address was included. Um, so on our blog, you can see a sample of what the deed looked like, and you can also see the smart contract address there as well. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the money was transferred from the escrow account over to the seller and the transaction was completed. In this case, um, the buyer did not have to be present in the area um, where the sale occurred, but he did have to have a power of attorney. That was an area where we still had to work within the confines of the current regulations, which you know we're willing to do. That's what just needs to happen as we continue to do more and more of these transactions. So um, uh, I'm looking at Propy uh, now uh, in its PROPY.com. It looks like we have uh, listings in San Francisco, Dubai, Beijing, New York. Um, I, I've been on the website. There's a, a property that I have an interest in in Scottsdale that's actually listed for sale. Um, so I kind of understand uh, the website, but for, for the people that may not be familiar with it, why don't you talk a little bit about what it takes Um you know what, uh, what? What if you have a property? How do how do we get involved? Uh, what are the advantages? Um, and why isn't Phoenix on there? You you can address that. Go ahead. So Phoenix will be on there. We are building up the inventory now. Um, I I will not name the brokerages yet because we are working on a press release, so it's coming. Um, just need to make sure we get those <laughs> releases. Um, there'll be quite a few properties in the Phoenix, Scottsdale, and South Phoenix area listed for sale before the end of this month. So anybody that was looking to come and find a property in warmer weather and you have some Bitcoin or Ether you're willing to spend, we have the properties for you. Um, it works very much like a listing platform. So there are a few components to um, Proppy. 
And one is that uh, it, it's a, not only a transaction platform, but it is a listing platform for you to be able to search right away and find those properties where the sellers are willing to accept cryptocurrency in exchange. We have quite a few currencies listed um, on the buyer's end. You can shop those listings and um, initiate the transactions. We are there. We are completing transactions. It's ready to go. Um, depending on the different jurisdictions, you know, we're either in exploratory conversations or working with the governments um, to make sure that we're compliant and everything is kosher. Uh, it's exciting though. So you'll see Phoenix kind of front and center soon here as soon as we get enough uh, <laughs> properties active, but that's all in the works right now as we speak. So um, we do also uh, not limit ourselves. If you do have a property, but you want to expose yourself to this marketplace, because we have targeted a book of businesses of individuals who are looking to divest and diversify and take their uh, cryptocurrency uh, in exchange for an asset, um, you're more than welcome to also list any properties that you have. Uh, when it comes to the currency selection, you would obviously omit uh, the cryptos that are listed. Uh, but uh, currently, the way that we're doing it, significant regular regulatory change is not necessary yet, um, but a lot of partnerships and fostering relationships is happening at this time. Very good. Very good. It's moving forward. You know, these are the types of things that we like to see. Uh, I do have a question from David Saxon. David, how are you, David? Uh, um, uh, David is a frequent viewer here. So did you, uh, did you fix the exchange rate against a fiat like the U.S. dollars? Okay. Yes, we did. Um, <laughs> uh, and how was that, how, how was that done? I think you you touched on it a little bit. Could you expand a little bit on on exactly how that was done and how that transaction happened? Uh, so in this case, um, I'm not sure if that's detailed in the blog post or uh, the okay. technical. Yeah, um, I'll have so to. Who was the buyer? Out. Uh, here, the buyer of the property was Michael Arrington, and it was in Bitcoin. And, and he was he, he played for it in Bitcoin, and he's somewhere in yeah. in, uh, in the United States. Uh, so it, it has happened. It is possible. That's the, that's the point, right? We completed fully from start to finish. Um, we do have other transactions in the works, um, and as soon as we're ready to release those details, we definitely will, just as we did with the Ukrainian transaction, and it will. I'll be the same. Um, you'll be able to view it, um, Etherscan, uh, for the details. Um, we'll write a post about it to share. Yes, the Michael Arrington, he's also one of the advisors um, and investors of Profi. Okay. And for those who are familiar, Michael Arrington is the founder of TechCrunch. Right. So he's the proud owner of a property purchased with Bitcoin. <laughs> and uh, he's probably sitting on a pile of it. So. He probably didn't check his balance uh, uh, once the transaction was completed. So I, I want to get um, Andrew up here and ask a little bit. Andrew is a, a cryptocurrency enthusiast um, and works in tax law and accounting and that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and I'd like to have uh, the three of us. I'm going to try and do this um, and get the three of us up here. Oh, it looks like it might, might work. Looks like it might work. Yes. All right. Can you guys hear me? Andrew. Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right. Perfect. How's it going today? Good, 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 good. Uh, so, um, well, a little bit of a, of a, a echo. I'll turn mine down a little bit. Um, but, um, uh, so we've been talking about real estate on the distributed ledger and transactions and, and, and things that are going on. I wanted you to kind of uh, uh, chime in a little bit. I mean, is there anything yeah. that you think should be said at this point? Are we uh, um, are we doing things that the federal government is not wanting us to do? You know, I, I don't see any issue in the transactions. Um, it really saves a step from having to cash out to fiat and then go through the traditional markets. You know, in my opinion, I don't see how this would violate any sort of tax law or any issues with the IRS. Um, if anything, it's going to save a lot of steps and a lot of extra calculation. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about people that buy um, uh, 
uh, property with cryptocurrency? What are the uh, what are the ramifications there that you see? Yeah, certainly. So there's kind of a bit of contention right now within the crypto tax space. Um, I've seen a lot of people that really want there to be 1031 exchange for crypto to crypto trades. I'm of the opinion that they don't qualify. We can jump into that maybe a little bit later. Um, but the idea is when you take that asset, so if you buy, you know, let's say 100 Bitcoins and they're a dollar each, you maybe got really lucky years ago. Um, and now that you're turning around and selling those, you know, the price fair market value of Bitcoin, I think it was what, $10,000 this morning. I think it slid down a little bit just for numbers sake. Um, you know, for you to turn around and use those Bitcoin to purchase real estate, you're going to have to recognize long term capital gains if you've held it for more than a year. So in that transaction and trading your your Bitcoins for real estate, there would be a taxable gain. And then you'd have your basis in your new home. And then when you turn around and sell the home, there's a couple of tax strategies that you can utilize if it's a US based primary residence. And so there's a couple of things that we'd want to take a look at as far as those moving pieces go to make sure that you know, you're kind of getting the best deal possible. And a lot of that has to do with the accounting period. And then also with you know how long you're going to stay in that residence, especially if it's a primary residence. Okay. And if it's an investment, uh, you know, it makes a difference if it's uh, an investment property or a primary residence, that makes a, a difference as far as the, the different tax, tax strategies that you can employ and use. Right. So, so, basically, so with the with, with investment ahead. real estate, there's no exemption. So when you buy and live in your home uh, for two or five years, or at least that's what it was before the tax law changed, I think they changed, ended up changing it back. You could exempt up to a quarter of a million dollars for single filers and then half a million dollars for married filing joint filers of capital gains on your property. So if you buy a home for $100,000 and you sell it for $250,000, you don't owe any capital gains on the home sale if you lived in your primary residence. Now, if it's an investment piece of property, you know if you take that piece of property and you depreciate it out, you subtract that from your basis, and then you take the sales price when you sell it, minus the basis to figure out what your capital gains are there. So that, that's how it changes just a little bit with the investment side of things. Um, but as far as, you know, if you're going to buy and hold long term, you know, would factor that in against the cash flow and kind of determine what sort of depreciation you want to take against it, what makes the most sense. You know, these guys that are flipping houses every three or four months, um, you know, would really want to step back and take a look. You know, it doesn't make sense to maybe hold on to a piece of property for more than a year so that you're in long term capital gains, not short term capital gains. Sure, sure. sure. And that makes a difference on uh, the investment and what you're putting into it and how you can, uh, can take those, uh, uh, those deductions. Um, certainly. Leslie, did you have any questions uh, as far as tax ramifications? You know, it's, no, uh, no <laughs> questions. No questions. <laughs> um, just in regards to Arizona a little bit too, a bill was introduced, um, where I, I love to see the conversation opened up. Uh, for Arizona taxpayers to be able to pay their state taxes using Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it all comes together, you know, a lot of overlap. Yeah. 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 When the federal government or when the city government or state government is thinking about taking uh, their, uh, their, their fee, their, their taxes in cryptocurrency, I, I mean, we're not talking about something that, you know, is kind of a flash in the pan. I mean, this stuff is staying. Uh, and I think they're looking right. at it from a point. Uh, Doug Ducey is quite progressive. A, uh, uh, a signature on a smart contract in the state of Arizona is binding and legal. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of good reasons for that. A lot of things that they're they're looking at. And you know, when you take a look at trying to structure some sort of a, a system for taking in tax revenues and having it uh, on a smart contract and having it in crypto and having been a, a, and be able to to take those uh, uh, transactions, there's there's a lot of economies of scale that they're taking advantage of. I want to publish another question and kind of throw it out. Do you think that the market is right for these transactions since there is no market to hedge the risk with either volatility? So basically, uh, um, I, I think the question revolves around some of the things that we've seen. I mean, if uh, if I buy um, a piece of property for fifteen thousand dollars with one Bitcoin and uh, uh, all of a sudden it's down to uh, you know ten thousand dollars, have I lost? Five thousand dollars, or how is that? And you know, what are some of the ramifications there as far as the tax strategy is concerned? Do we actually make a loss? Can we register that loss? Um, and, and 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 how do we take care of this? I'll just throw this open. Go ahead. Yeah. So with with that, um, you know, it depends on when you bought that initial 
Bitcoin that you used to buy that piece of property. If you turn around, you know, so in your example, you know, you have uh, one Bitcoin for fifteen thousand dollars. That you, you know, if you buy that and then you turn around when Bitcoin's ten thousand dollars and you trade that for that property, you've technically got a five thousand dollars short term capital loss if that all happens within, say, the span of a week. So with that, um, yeah, you could potentially set up some strategies where you'd look around that. But I think most people that have the the amount of Bitcoin that you're going to be buying real estate with are probably people that have been in the market for a long time. And they're probably going to be recognizing some gains. Now, that if you're constantly buying additional Bitcoin and playing the market, or if you're mining, and uh, there's a whole host of things that we can do within the mining space, you know, you're basically creating fair market value cryptocurrency to trade on the market that you then get to write off expenses against. There's a lot of strategies that we can employ. Um, but it's kind of hard to always say, you know, well, here's some ideas for taxes without having specific numbers. You know, everyone's situation is going to be a little bit different. What might be good for you, Michael, might not be good for Leslie. You know, you just really have to balance. Really, it's the accounting and you know your timing. You know, do you want to ride that market back up? Do you think cryptocurrency is going to go up in three weeks when everyone stops worrying about, you know, China banning Bitcoin, you know, for the fourth time this year, um, and trying to plan it around that and your investment strategy overall? Yeah, that's it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, they keep on going around and going, "Hey, we're banning Bitcoin. Uh, maybe we won't. Um, no, we're going to ban it. Right. Oh, maybe not." Uh, we're going to ban it, but if we ban it and everyone else is doing it, how do we? Uh, I, and I think there's more than than one country are trying to wrestle with that kind of stuff. And um, uh, in, in the end, this will um, uh, this will open up the the borders for trade, and we'll be able to uh, conduct business across borders uh, using cryptocurrencies. And I don't think that there is just. A, um, uh, I don't think that there is you know, any way they can stop it at this point. Um, I yeah. do have a quick question and I want to publish this. And then, uh, Andrew, I want you to, uh, I need you to do a shameless plug for me. So the question is, uh, the transactions are for outright buys and not things like mortgages at this point, correct? So this system will roll out where certain countries or states respect the authority of smart contracts. Kind of two questions there. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, outright buys and not uh, and not uh, mortgages, right? So Leslie, right. why don't you go ahead and answer that one? Right, outright buys. And, uh, yes, hi, Jason. Uh, yeah, so they're outright buys. Um, I think another point that we definitely don't want to ha have overlooked, you know, outside of the cryptocurrency um, buyers and sellers, is we're utilizing blockchain in a way to really just revolutionize the entire process um and when it comes to involving other countries and adoption as well um you know to other countries uh their appeal is that it's a solution to their current level of corruption or fraud um other countries are looking at it as well we don't really have anything formal or standard now so this would be a great solution um so it's twofold. You know, it's great. We're attracting and we're able to propose the transactions for those buyers and sellers. Um, like Andrew touched on, typically a lot of these buyers are going to be people who didn't make uh, significant capital gains on these and are maybe trying to take a portion of that and uh, diversify, uh, turn it into a physical asset. But currently, no, back to the first question, nothing in regards to mortgage. But I, I think that's coming. Um, I, I think it's failed miserably. I mean, BitConnect has been taken down. Uh, they had kind of a, a quasi lending. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should not. not I should with the ten foot pole. <laughs> What's that? I said I'm not, not touching touch BitConnect with the ten foot pole. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, um, it was a learning experience, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. And I think we're having we're seeing a lot of things that um, or Ponzi schemes and uh, stuff that don't have uh, things that don't have good fundamentals. I think when we're looking at, at cryptocurrencies, we're looking at uh, investing either our time. And in my case, uh, you know, I, I work with a lot of the companies that are looking at minting coins and rationalizing workflows, that kind of thing. So I invest my time. And I think there's uh, people that are listening to us that are interested in investing money and, and effort and and, uh, uh, and these kinds of things. And I think when we look at them. We can't look at what's going on on the hype sites. We can't look at going on and what, what, what people are saying. We have to really look at what we know uh, and what we feel uh, will work and how uh, the future will look to us and then follow that train and, and find, uh, uh, find an organization that, 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 that kind of 
uh, blends well with the, your thoughts and what you're looking at as far as the future and then kind of match your investment and your criteria up against that. So, um, but uh, back to the question at hand, as far as mortgage is concerned, yeah, that's going to be a sticky bit. That's going to be uh, difficult to, uh, to do, but, uh, and, and, and we've had the first failure of a, of a big one in BitConnect, but I think that there's a couple of ways to do it. I mean, I, I, I have some folks in accounts receivable, AR financing that are really interested in this kind of, um, uh, if someone buys something with coin and they don't have enough coin, uh, where's the Delta and is the Delta on the portion of the buyer or the seller? And there's, there's things that are coming down the, the pike that, uh, um, uh, I think will will kind of smooth this out. And I think we've learned a, a, a good lesson with BitConnect. Um, and Andrew, if you want to talk about BitConnect, feel free. Yeah, certainly. So um, the thing that kind of concerned me about BitConnect was when you start looking at how the, the transaction works out, where you're basically swapping your Bitcoin for their coin, that to me, that, once again, keep in mind the, the guidance that the IRS has given out has been one notice back in 2014 that says cryptocurrency is property, mining self-employment income. If you pay in wages, you have to pay payroll taxes and that's about it. There's not really a lot of guidance in between. And that's kind of where that 1031 exchange question really comes into play a lot of you know, whether or not you can trade crypto for crypto and defer gains. Uh, when you look at the steps of the transaction within BitConnect, to me, that doesn't look like interest bearing. That looks more like a sale. You know, We'd have to kind of take a look at when you actually had the ability to move that money you know, if you've got that locked up for three months and you're getting payment out of it, you're not actually getting paid back in, in your type of cryptocurrency. You're getting paid back in their token from what I can tell. I never personally invested in it. I've had a couple of clients that I've had to kind of walk them through the process and say, okay, well, tell me what's going on here and let, let's, you know, see if it walks, talks and, and sounds like a duck. Um, to me, I, I think the Irish would come back and argue that BitConnect was, was a sale, not interest bearing investments. Could be. Um, so, and, and I think I'll, I'll reserve judgment for some time in the future, but I, I think it's coming yeah. and I think there's, I think that's, that, that's a problem that will have a solution. And the last, uh, sure. uh, part of the question, this system will roll out where certain countries or states respect the authority of smart contracts and Jason, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and the answer is Arizona already respects in, in many ways, the authority of smart contracts, uh, a signature on a smart contract is legal and binding. Um, so we have to be careful the way that we're drawing these uh, smart contracts up. Uh, make sure you have smart guys in the room that you know this know this kind of stuff. People like Andrew and people like Leslie. Um, uh, make sure that uh, if you're thinking about doing something like this, you reach out, pick up the phone, and and uh, and do a sanity check. Uh, anyone want to talk a little bit about? about that, about the legalities and, and what they're seeing coming down the road? I mean, I, I can jump in just from a, a general standpoint. You know, states had a bit of an arms race when it came to forming LLC laws. Um, I think we'll see a very similar issue with, you know, crypto and, and smart contracts of there's a, there's a lot of wealth concentrated in this. Um, the, a lot of the guys that I work with out in California, sometimes the tax advice is, how do you feel about moving? How about getting out of literally California, go to any other state because your tax rate is going to get cut in half. Um, I think states that are smart can keep ahead of it. Like it sounds like Arizona is doing are, are going to attract a lot of those investors. Um, and they're going to eventually be the ones that are spending money in those communities. Now that the next fight is, well, you know, if we're doing interstate commerce, where's the nexus? Where's the actual point of sale? Is there sales tax due? You know, if we're not talking about real estate transactions, we start talking about um, interstate just property buys outside of, traditional real property there that's gonna be a whole nother post so the states that are up and ahead of it are gonna be the ones that are gonna be able to have the legal claim to it and set the precedents before anybody else can and that'll be a very sure. interesting i think 10 years out maybe from seeing that but it'll be a very interesting fight in my opinion yeah, yeah and these states, are, go ahead a lot more states are, are starting to look at um, language and seeing how they can uh what can they what they're ready for <laughs> um arizona i'm pretty proud of you know our state in saying um all the um, attention that this is getting i know representative david schreikert here did lead the uh, congressional blockchain caucus so we have formal groups we have uh, elected officials um, who have power 
um, and influencing them and really taking initiative um, in regards to this. So I'm very optimistic about where Arizona's going to go. Um, and I anticipate, you know, outside of Arizona, California, and Vermont, and some of these other states who do have a blockchain and smart contract friendly legislation in play, um, it's natural that other states just follow. Yeah, and and I think there's I, I think from my my standpoint and just an observation, um, you know, there's two different uh, schools of thought. There's, you know, I I I've coined a, a new law. It's called Noel's law, and Noel's law is that uh, any centralized organization um, that is confronted with a decentralized application, their first thing they're going to do is try and centralize it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So. <laughs> there you go, right? Um, uh, you've got two schools of thought, and, and you've got the groups that are going, oh, a decentralized decision-making, kind of a artificial intelligence, and it's, it can do things based on a if, then, then, that, and it can transfer wealth and transfer money all at the same time. I don't have to have someone sitting in a room with a rubber stamp uh, transferring trust. Wow, this is interesting. Let's see what we can do about looking at the workflow, looking at workflow management, and, and building something different that's that's going to uh, uh, that's going to work and going to uh, speed up the process. And then you've got the, another group that's going, okay, decentralization uh, mechanism. Let's see how we can centralize it. Let's see how we can change it, and let's see how we can force our centralized uh, ways of thought uh, onto it. I think one of those ways is going to win, and one of those ways is going to lose. Um, and and anyone that knows me probably knows which way my thoughts are. A uh, couple of questions, uh, good questions good, that we've got going here. Um, what consensus is in place for a transaction? Is it a two-way validation between the buyer and the sellers? So, Leslie, do you want to answer that, or do you want me to try and, and, and take a shot at it? What would you like? Um, I'd be curious to hear your response on that. Um, but there, we have a couple different smart contracts. Okay, back up for me again one more time. I just want to. Oh, hang on. There you go. What consensus is in place for a transaction? Is it just a two-way validation between the buyer and the seller, or is there some sort of consensus? Yeah, that's a good question. So I haven't had to broach that question before. Um, typically, another technical um, member of the team will broach that for us. Um, I do want to get you the correct answer to that, though, as well. Um, I know we do go in depth in our white paper in regards to our smart contracts and the validation that's done. Um, so if you go to whitepaper.com uh, or our token sale page, um, you can find those details there. Um, but yeah, what right. was your, what, what is my, what is my take on it? Well, uh, so you've kind of answered the, the, um, uh, well, you know, what's the consensus as far as the paperwork is concerned. Um, and, and my answer is kind of different than that. I mean, uh, if it's on the blockchain and it's gone through the consensus and been registered on the blockchain, then there is, uh, you know, there, there's, there's miners and, and there's stuff that goes out and there's a consensus. Uh, that that bit is going to be added to the blockchain. And it, there, there has to be some sort of consensus, but depending upon if it's a, a private chain, a, a group chain, or a public chain, the consensus varies from one uh, different type of mechanism, distributed ledger to the next. But there's always a consensus where there's a preponderance that, yes, this bit is, is correct, and I have 10, 50, 80, percent of the people that are out there that uh, say that this is that this bit is correct a lot of transactions take 10 people for consensus or you know 15 uh, it just depends but the point of it is is the the consensus is built into the blockchain uh that owns the piece of property or controls the piece of property or in this case transferred ownership of the piece of property um and uh, the consensus belongs to the blockchain and how the blockchain is set up um and that's something that doesn't change when you mint a coin uh, uh, you you create a coin, uh, your consensus algorithms and and everything is set up in advance. So that's something that uh, um, that's done not only outside of the chain, but but inside the chain and it's kept on the chain. If someone comes back ten years later and tries to change it and say, "Look, you don't own that piece of property. I own this piece of property," and they go into their version of the blockchain that they have on their wallet locally and they change it, 
and uh, that gets propagated, it goes out into the blockchain, there's going to be people out there that says, hey, listen, your version differs from my version. Uh, let's check with someone else. And as they check with other people, they realize that the version has been changed. And they change his version back. That's that's the uh, the uh, uh, the purpose of the distributed ledger. That's the way the distributed ledger works, and that's the big advantage. It's it's basically unhackable. And um, I've had people within the Southwest Security Professionals Group tell me it's it's hackable. Someone's going to hack it. There are some ways to hack it. Fifty one percent hack and and this kind of thing. But right now uh, there's a you know a a billion dollar bounty on on uh on bitcoin to hack it and no one's hacked it's uh, acted so far so the blockchain itself remains unhacked um it's just the smart contracts the exchanges and the stuff that we put uh, on them that uh, that have um uh that have the the uh, vulnerabilities so i hope uh, i hope we answered that question uh is it i think we did yeah go ahead what was that what was that Pulling it up for me just one more time, if I can get the um, more detailed response right now. Yeah, I just deleted it. I just deleted it as being answered, so I I can't bring it back up. But that's I, I you know he was you know is it is there, his question was is there uh, some sort of consensus or is it uh, just a transaction between one or two players? Um, and I think we have time for uh, one more question from David Saxton. Uh, is this real estate traction, uh, transaction the first on the blockchain in the U.S., uh, or what makes it unique? So a little bit about Propi, what they're doing, and that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, yes, it is. It is the first one. And then instead of being the first one, I know that there are some other players in the marketplace who are um, currently executing pilot programs or are attempting to do the same thing. Uh, we were able to be the first um, to take it from start to finish, and we do have other transactions in uh, process right now. Um, so as soon as those um, are you know, ready to discuss the details, we'll be sharing that on our website. And, I, and I'm assuming Propi is going to go into other different things um, uh, other than um, uh, sales and rentals and that kind of stuff, those kinds of transactions property management, that kind of stuff. Property management fits really well within the blockchain, within the distributed ledger. Um, you can you, you can have a, um, in the state of Arizona anyway, you can have a, a block a distributed ledger or a blockchain that owns a piece of property. Um, when it owns a piece of property, it can pay the maintenance people, it can collect rents, it can do all kinds of things. So um, I'm sure that Propi is, uh, is aware of these kinds of things, they'll be working on these kinds of things that we look forward to awesome 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 things for you and if uh if i can help you out leslie you have my number please reach out and let me know um anything else for the audience uh, we're we're in the in the final few moments here no no i'm i'm good if you guys have questions throughout tax season if you want help sorting out the mess that it's going to be because there's a lot of unknowns I just threw my email in the, the group chat. Feel free to reach out to me. We're always happy to give a free 15 minute consultation, help people get on the straight and narrow. But other than that, you know, I'll see you guys maybe after April 17th this year. And, and Andrew, tell, I, I didn't give you your yeah. opportunity to do a shame promotion. So let's, uh, let's get that done. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Andrew Kronoski. I'm an enrolled agent with Dean Owen CPA in Western Kentucky. We handle all 50 States for any kind of tax or back tax issues. A lot of our clients are coming to us after you know being involved in cryptocurrencies for a lot since uh, 2013, and we're doing a lot of back tax filing because you need to have your stuff ready and up to snuff if you're going to have a major cash out. Um, we can help you with the planning portion of it. We can help you with some financial planning outside of the crypto space as well, depending on what state you're in. Uh, but we want to make sure that people are getting information out so they're not overpaying their taxes. Good. And um, what 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 brings you into uh, uh, blockchain? I mean, what's your interest here? So I, I'm an investor myself. Um, I've been looking at different ICOs. I also do a little bit of mining here and there. Um, and then also getting really excited about some of these coins that you can do staking in and trying to find some ways to work around that. Um, my goal is to really bring crypto into a, a space where, you know, we've got little old ladies that come in and ask me questions about Bitcoin. So I had to become an expert really quick on well, you know, do I invest in this? Well, I mean, you can, but there's other things that you can look at too. Um, I, I think the financial industry is going to see a massive shift of 
you know, it's not necessarily you have to have a hundred dollars to buy a whole share of stock. You can buy fractional amounts of cryptocurrency and invest in the market. So I think being able to educate potential investors more so than just, well, what looks nice, what's got a, a flashy white paper and, and teaching them how to, okay, well, let's vet some of the fundamentals here. What are they trying to accomplish? Is there a team? Do they have advisors? Are they US based? Are they not US based? That's kind of where I come from on this side of things. Yeah, uh, back to the fundamentals. Is there a transfer of trust? Uh, are there sticky bits? Um, uh, is there money in the transaction? And um, does it make things quicker? Does it ease the process? Uh, you know, um, growth hacking rule number one is make it simpler or someone else will. And that's basically what um, uh, we're seeing. The vast majority of the coins that are coming out there that are surviving the onslaught are, are, are ones that have the good basics. Um, they, they, there's value in the transaction. There, there's transfer of trust. Um, we talked a little bit about the uh, earlier, Leslie talked a little bit about brokers and things of this nature and that transfer of trust. That's expensive and it takes time when something on the distributed ledger we can do like that for a tenth of the cost. Um, uh, is there uh, sticky points? Are people trying to argue uh, and uh, are they trying to return property and saying, well, look, stuff we gave you is not quite what it is, but we can take care of that in the distributed ledger. So look at the look at the fundamentals when you're taking a look at being, becoming involved in in uh, cryptocurrencies and, and looking at investing either your money or your time or your effort or your your um, uh, you know giving out uh, advice to um, your your grandma who's asking you about <laughs> cryptocurrencies, which is great. Exactly. I, I, it's, it's great, man. I I, I um, I've existed in a world where yeah, there's not a lot of people that really understand cryptocurrencies, and, and now we have grandmas mm -hmm. asking, you know, what do you, what do you think about Bitcoin? So yeah, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. Well, I, all right. I, I call it my little old lady test. You know, I'm I'm here in rural Kentucky. When I have little old ladies asking me about cryptocurrency, that tells me that we're on the brink of mass adoption in some cases. Mm -hmm. So the more more volume yes. I get of phone calls inbound, that tells me exactly where the the general general investors at. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's coming. I really do. Um, and all the indications are out there. Let's, it'll be interesting. Um, uh, it, it, we li we're living in interesting times. There's just no doubt about that. It's interesting times that we certainly. Uh, Leslie, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you for investing in Blockchain Weekly. Uh, thanking us. Uh, thank you for helping us educate people on blockchain. Blockchain technology education will help spur adoption. Uh, and that's what we're all about. Andrew, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anything else you want to add as far as a, a closing bit? No, just make sure everyone's paying their taxes and filing timely. You know, it sucks to pay your taxes, but it helps bring it more into the mainstream so that we can all grow in a little bit more uh, legal sense to get it more normalized. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. I want to thank Mike and, and Shindig. Uh, for the lovely opportunity of uh, getting together. This is an interesting forum. Uh, seems to work really well.